Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us here on the ice on Amateur Sports TV, Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Thanks for joining us. Like I said, I've had a lot of discussion with a lot of different leagues east and west of us here in Manitoba with regards to return to play and potentially starting a season once we hear from the provincial health authorities. We spoke with Kevin McCallum, the GM of the Cam River Fight and Walleye earlier this month, and today we're going to talk to the president of the SIJHL, Mr. Darren Nichols, Nicholas, uh, and talk about the ongoing discussions and planning he's having with the five teams that are currently allowed to be playing in the SI, as well as what we may see uh, in the current uh, season of 2021 uh, after announcements in February perhaps could allow us to come back to some sort of participation and competition in the SI. So please welcome Darren Nicholas on the ice. As promised, Darren Nicholas joining me, the president of the SIJHL. Darren, is it starting to feel like winter? Uh, it is officially, yeah. I was uh, I was out to the house a little bit earlier today and uh, thought uh, in, in an ordinary year this would have been uh, been welcome weather, but uh, now that we're into the negative teens, it seems uh, it's really unusual for this time of year, so maybe we've got to tight, uh, toughen up a little bit. <laughs> we've got to toughen up a little bit. We've been tough already. We've dealt with quite a tough year as it is, Darren. Uh, certainly with uh, the unability and the unfortunate circumstance of not seeing any style or any type of hockey in Northwestern Ontario, uh, including the states below us. Tell us what it's been like over the last, you know, six months for you being the, in your first year as being the president of the SIJHL. Uh, well, well, I mean, we did manage to get going a little bit there uh, mid-November. Um, you know, if you think back to the summertime, we had uh, uh, we had delayed the start of the season, and our target opening date was November sixteenth uh, or fifteenth, I believe, if I remember correctly. And uh, you know, as as the way things turned out, we likely could have started our regular season on that date. Um, we just had a couple of things uh, left to iron out with respect to some of our facilities. We still didn't have uh, teams that had uh, permanent ice in their rink and stuff. So we, you know, we decided to start with an exhibition schedule and then that kind of morphed into a regular season game. So, you know, we did, we did get going a little bit before Christmas there. And then, uh, you know, unfortunately with, uh, um, in Ontario, they, they announced, uh, uh, a lockdown basically, uh, uh, effective December 26th that that sort of shut us down for a, a 14 day period. And we were thinking that was, uh, going to work out okay for us because it was entirely within our, you know, uh, plan to bring the kids back, uh, quarantine them before we started our schedule and, and, and really had the lockdown not been extended, it would have occurred, uh, entirely within that period there. So. Uh, you know, that was uh, uh, planned to return on a January 13th. They, they extended the lockdown for another 14 days, so it would expire on the 23rd. Uh, we had then planned for a 26th return of our schedule. And then uh, just last week, Ontario province announced a state of emergency for 28 days, which closes it till February 11th. So it's just been kind of a series of hiccups in, in trying to get the guys back on the ice. You say it so lightly, just a bunch of hiccups. It really hasn't been hiccups. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's been a lot of just big sighs and saying, okay, when next? When next? And I want to go back to that 2020 part of the season where we had a bit of an exhibition season, a bit of a regular season. My understanding is it, the exhibition games were supposed to be eight, but there was only four. Is that correct? Was that something that was decided to allow for the potential of more regular season games to be played? Or just the fact that it wasn't working, the fact that you're only playing one team. Yeah, no, it, it really kind of morphed into, uh, you, you know, everything was happening, uh, it, it seemed quickly, and, and we're trying to get clarity on what type of a schedule we can run. And, you know, so when, you know, when we first got clearance to start playing games, it was exactly as you had indicated that it was, um, you know, our leagues were restricted to only 50 participants. So in junior hockey, that meant, you know, we could have a league that consisted of two teams. Uh, 
together basically uh, until things changed. So, you know, we had the walleye and the North Stars that thought, uh, you know, it would make sense for them to jump into a, 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 a a series of games and and they did some marketing around it and came up with the teleco cup and that's what uh, the two thunder bay teams uh, scheduled an eight game exhibition series uh, not unlike the the old uh, uh canada russia series in 72 they were going to play eight games and figure out who was going to be the winner of this uh, preseason cup then when we got more clarity about uh you know how our schedule could look in the 14 day uh, turnaround time uh that we would have to have in between opponents um, we started doing the math and said, you know what, there is probably no way that we could get a, you know, a reasonable schedule in if we waited until after, after Christmas to start it. So, you know, we determined that, you know, we we're going to try and play a 20 game schedule, which would have uh, each team playing four games against each opponent and that we needed to get four of those games or one block of games done before Christmas. So then, you know, we just morphed the last four games of that series, uh, the Teleco Cup series, into regular season games. So they still completed it, but it was four preseason, four regular season. And, uh, you know, and then we, uh, you know, we already had uh, Dryden and Red Lake in a cohort together. So they carried on and played four regular season games as well. What did you like? What did you see in those two cohort games, so to speak, between the two Thunder Bay squads or near Thunder Bay squads and Dryden and Thief River? What were you able to check them out in person? And if not, what did you see in terms of video that impressed you the most from the teams uh, following protocol and just the play that you saw on the ice? Yeah, no, I was able to see uh, all of our teams play uh, in, in person for sure. Um, you know, it was a process, uh, you know, we're, we're having to play under modified rules as well when we got there. So we, we couldn't have any body contact or intentional contact in our games. And, uh, you know, coaches, on-ice officials were really good with it. And and the players were too. Um, you know, you, you'd, you'd look at the game summaries at the end of the night and, and, you know, first game you'd see five or six minor penalties for body checking. And, and the next night you'd see four or five. So it constantly got better as the players adapted to it um you know the style of play was a lot quicker uh made for probably frustrating for the coaches uh to to you know not be able to coach and play the game the way that that everybody's accustomed to but they were all really uh you know appreciative of the fact that we were able to get back on the ice in some fashion anyways so uh you know from what i was uh, seeing early i uh, the comments i made was i, I think it's you know real uh, parody in the league there it's it's tough to tell uh, you know until everybody's played each other who's going to be the str- the strong team but you know or, or or you know the real strength of the league but uh, from what I've seen, it, it uh, would have made for some interesting competition uh, if and when we're able to get back on the ice. You, you mentioned that the competition it obviously looked different without any type of body contact. Uh, could you imagine yourself playing in those type of games when you've played six or eight years of body contact and all of a sudden you're told, <laughs> no, you can't touch another body? No, I have got a lot of respect for those uh those players and and you know i coached the game for a long time and and certainly you know physical contact was always something that i i tried to preach to my teams and and doing the right things and finishing checks and 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 stuff like that and you know i i had a uh, tour of duty back in peewee hockey a few years back when i got back into coaching and and i'd, I'd forgotten that there was no body contact at the at the peewee and under and uh, it, it was a frustrating season for me as a coach to try and, uh, you know, give players other solutions to try and take the puck other than just waiting for it to happen. And I, I can kind of feel the, uh, uh, the pain, if you will, of the players that gone through it. But they, they did a tremendous job. They were, they were really uh, uh, making every attempt they could in order to, to adhere to the guidelines for sure. When you're able to have a chance to look at all the games and visit the teams and the recreation facilities in person, what did you notice about the community and the fact that there was hockey returning in some form and just that upbeat, positive energy within those communities uh, when seeing that there was a game on that night? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the teams are. I mean, the teams are a big deal in our communities, and it's it's part of what helps make the winters seem a little bit shorter out this way. So, um, you know, I knew my own experience in in you know going through the process. You know, seeing seeing sports of all kinds stop in March. Um, you, you know, and when 
into the spring and summer when the NHL was looking for their options to get back on the ice, it didn't really seem all that important in the whole grand scheme of things that, um, you, you know, why are they going through all this trouble in order just to, you know, just to say they finished a season. But, you know, when the games came on and, and, and the schedule resumed and they went right into the playoffs, you know, I, like many others, was sitting in front of the TV because it's, it's, you know, it's part of what we do. And uh, that was my message to our group that we're kind of, you know, at times questioning whether it's worth it to, to go through all the trouble to try and get back on the ice and, and just, you know, need to be reminded of how important our teams are in the community, um, how important it is to, to have something else uh, going on to focus on other than the pandemic. And, uh, you know, for a few weeks, we were able to give that back to communities. The five teams that were involved, you were also able to bring in a couple of U18, U16 teams, I believe, to help out with some of the scheduling. Was that correct? Yeah, yeah. It started with, uh, uh, you know, identifying a need to have one team in the standings because, of course, the way that we had to go through our schedule was, you know, you know a short window of competition and then an extended 14-day period where we can't play games because we've got to, you know, switch from one opponent to the other. And, you know, with a five team or a seven team counting our American based teams, you know, we, we would always have one team that's going through a 30 plus day stretch of the schedule, you know, since they played their last game, because we're going to have one team out of competition all the time. So, you know, they would have to, you know, sit out the next competition window. Uh, they would also have to do the 14 day reset with everybody else because we wouldn't have another team to play. So it just, you know, logistically worked way better for us if we can have another team. And, and I knew the 18U teams were struggling to to find a place to play as well. Of course, the Kenora, uh, you know, belongs to the Manitoba AAA Midget League and, and they couldn't get permission to cross even the provincial boundary to go and play in Manitoba. So they were kind of stranded and, and had a team assembled and was just looking. So that seemed like a kind of a natural Natural fit, and then, and then it uh, kind of morphed into uh, you know, is there a way that we can do the same thing with the Thunder Bay Kings program as well and their team? That of course, uh, you, you know, they made some noise this year when they announced they joined the Greater uh, Toronto Hockey League uh, on a full time basis. But uh, you know, they're they're not playing either. So we had two 18U Triple A teams in the region that were kind of stranded. Um, Playing each other wasn't an option, so we thought, geez, is there a way we could incorporate them into our schedule, uh, keep our teams playing all the way, and, and then give them something of a, of a schedule. So that's how it worked out, and, and uh, Kenora was, was matched up against the Fort Francis Lakers for the first round before Christmas and, and uh, you know, had some competitive action there. And, uh, you know, we had the two Kings teams playing here uh, as well before Christmas as well, the 16Us and the 18Us. A great resource to have at your fingertips, Darren, but also wonderful to bring in the midget program to see what it's like to play that next level of hockey, correct? Yeah, I mean, we wanted to use it as, uh, you know, as an opportunity to give them an experience, uh, you know, experience our, our game day operations, experience everything about uh, our league playing maybe in the different buildings that they might not have been in in the past. And uh you know, that was kind of our our thought, you know, in addition to simply getting the kids on the ice, getting them into into a competition mode, um, you know, the ability to actually get some game film, you know, something as simple as that for these kids uh, is really important for the ones that are entering into their draft leader. I mean, there's, there's probably literally nothing to be scouted on them, uh, you know, so at least we can say we got them into game situations and, and now we do have some video that scouts can use to to evaluate. We're going to talk a little more about that after the break with Darren Nicholas and the importance of getting that film video and that exposure when we come back here on the ice. So stay tuned. We'll be right back.
Darren Nicholas, president of the SIJHL, joining me on the ice today. We talked before the break real quick, Darren, about getting exposure for some of these players. Now, obviously, in whether you play AAA hockey, U16, 18, even the Bantam years, they're not playing hockey right now. But also for the SIJHL, the importance of promoting not just players but coaches to the next level and seeing them continue their uh, hockey endeavors in a different location after they age out or if they're looking for an education perhaps. What has the, what does the league or what has the league done to help with that next level for some of these players that are aging out upcoming? Well, we're just, you know, we're, we're considering, you know, what else we can do, I guess. It might be the best way to say it. Um, you know, so much up in the air, but, uh, you know, depending on when things open up here in Ontario, we're, you know, mulling about the opportunity, you know, is, is there an opportunity to, to, to do some kind of a showcase for our graduating players, you know, the ones that have gone out and, 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 it, and that, re, you know, that remains to be seen. I mean, what we've done is, you know, we've talked to um, the teams, talked to a lot of players and really, you know, not much is different uh, in terms of the whole scope of things as it sits right now. I mean, to, to get to the next level, I mean, you need to differentiate. And, um, you know, that means working hard off the ice, working what you can on the skill. And, and everybody's in the same boat, you know. So uh, differentiation this season might look a lot different than, than it has in the past. And it might be a lot, you know, a little bit more challenging to, to get that to, uh, in, in front of college scouts. But, um you know, we do have some game film on all of our players. Uh, you know, I, I have been uh, uh, trying to promote and responding certainly to requests that uh, that come in for information on the league and players. Uh, but a lot of times the players have to take it upon themselves too, and it becomes a bit of a marketing um, uh, exercise as well to, uh, you know, to let college teams, coaches, or whatever the next level is, whether that's in Canada, whether that's in the States or it's pro, um, you know, they have to let them know they exist. And, and uh, a lot of the players have advisors that they work with as well that, uh, you know, that take care of a lot of that stuff. And, you know, our job is to see if we can get them on the ice as frequently as we can, uh, get some quality video of them and, and, and let them get scouted as well. And as I said, we're, you know, we're considering, um, you know, whether or not uh, there's a need and, and a desire to have, um, you know, even something if we can't resume our schedule here, at least to give the, uh, you know, the graduating players uh, one last kick at it here. So there could be a possibility of a showcase tournament, so to speak, if you're allowed to, to allow for the promotion of these players to move on. I think that's a great idea, Darren. Um, yeah, one of the, I mean, it's, a, you know, it's easier to say than it is to do. I mean, the problem right. is that, you know, our, our league requires, not requires, but, <coughs> excuse me, you know, a lot of the players come from outside the region, you know, and, and so then it becomes of, uh, you know, can we do a showcase type of thing, number one, and then number two, uh, it, you know, is there, is there a desire for players to participate in it? You know, would it make sense to bring a kid from Victoria, B.C., you know, back into Thunder Bay to play for, a, you know, a weekend or four or five days or something like that? So, uh, you know, what pretty much what we've decided since the lockdown has happened, and this doesn't change uh, with respect to this concept either, is, you know, we're just going to, wait and see, I guess, right? Rather than plan for something and, and, and put a ton of effort and energy into, into planning for something that doesn't come to fruition, it's just going to be, let's take our foot off the gas pedal, let's observe, let's see what happens. And if, if an environment presents itself for us to do something, then we'll consider it at that time. That's exactly the same message Kevin gave to me a little while ago. The last time I spoke with him saying, it's been hard to wait and see. Yeah. I think everyone's done waiting and done seeing. They want to get on the ice. They want to do something about it. Uh, how hard has it been, I mean, from a planning perspective as a league president, to say to the teams, it's not your it's not your doing. It's above you that's saying we can't play. And I'm sure now the message has been understandable, saying, yeah, it's out of our hands, really. It's basically what the message and what the information, the guidelines were given. We just have to play by those rules. Yeah, no, that's exactly it. And, and and our group has been nothing of supportive from the messages and, and, and concepts that have come out of, uh, you know, out of, out of the league office. Um, 
you know, I talked to a colleague of mine that, that, that does my job in a different league. And, and he says, that, you know, the talk around their circle was just they've never put so much time and effort into building plans that have never gotten off the ground in their whole career. You know, and that's uh, that really resonated with me because that's kind of exactly where we were. You know, it's uh, um, OK. We can't open up on Christmas, uh, you, you know, after Christmas when we thought we could. So we're going to have to move the schedule. So here's the new schedule try and secure ice for that you know we're not the only tenants in our buildings that we deal with so that you know that all gets moved around you know teams do a great job they secure their ice uh, lockdown happens again and, and then that throws a whole bunch of kinks into it you know uh, uh, i can't get ice on this day it has to be these dates okay let's see if we can move that around so it's just you know uh, it almost seemed like an exercise in futility to be quite honest with you is, is, you know, trying to make plans in this environment. And then again, you know, you recognize that if you're reassembling the teams and you've got players coming in from out of region, then you have to quarantine them. Um, so we put a plan in place to, you know, have them get back to the communities, quarantine for 14 days. And, and then, you know, things can even change during that period of time, you know, right. so, um, uh, just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, um, yeah, it's been a frustrating experience for sure on that front. Darren, have you had, obviously you had league meetings with coaches or GMs with the prospective teams. Have you come up with a date or have you come up with a scenario where you're going to have to unfortunately pull the plug on this winter part of the season and start planning for a fall 21 return to hockey in the SI? Yeah, well, that's essentially what we said we're doing now is, uh, you know, the opportunity cost to uh, to consider, you know, continue throw energy behind, you know, what may or may not happen in, in 2021 here for the for the part of this season. You know, we've we've just acknowledged that, like, there's so much work that needs to get done. Certainly, if you talk to uh, most people that do my job. Uh, they're, they're saying that this is the time of year when you start planning already for next season. So, you know, what we didn't want to do was kind of get caught holding the ball next fall because of the work we couldn't do now while trying to get back on the ice for this season. So, you know, we, we've decided that, you know, we wanted, you know, we, we need to get three things out of our season. You know, number one is is we need to play a meaningful regular season. So, you know, we're not interested in playing only one other team in our league or playing eight games. You know, we want to play. We've set sort of 20 games as the, uh, as the standard in terms of, quote, unquote, a meaningful regular season. So, you know, if, if that has to slip to 18 games or 16 games, we can probably find a way to make that work. But... If, uh, you know, if it comes to the fact that we can only get 12 or eight games in in a regular season, you just have to question, you know, the work involved in doing that and, and is the payoff worth it, right? So, you know, we want to find a way to get a meaningful regular season in. Uh, you know, we talked about the ability to kind of compress our season if we just go straight to a league final and we take our top two teams that play for the, the Bill Salon and Cup in our league. Um, you know, the, the governors of our league thought that it was important to have a semifinal series uh, just to give more teams, to the, you know, the, uh, the chance to play for something as we're going through the regular season. So, you know, we, we said we didn't want to, you know, really eliminate rounds in the playoffs. We wanted to have a proper playoff. And then, you know, the kicker on it for us is that, you know, by, by mid-April, most of our facilities are starting to get antsy about taking the ice out and stuff like that. So, you know, the, the ability to uh, extend the season indefinitely or into the summer was really not an option either. So, you know, we want to have meaningful regular season. We want to have a competitive uh, playoff with a semifinal round, and it's got to get done by the, you know, the third week in April is sort of what we're working against. So, you know, if and when things open up here, uh, you know, we'll make a determination at that time as to whether we can achieve that or not. February 11th is the date that supposedly we'll start seeing a little bit more information trickle down through Ontario. Darren Nicholas, president of the SIJHL, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate the clarification. I'm hoping for a season because I would love to see those kids and know those kids want to get back on the ice, as do the communities. Likewise, for sure. There, it's, We're all hoping for that, and uh, um, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess.
Thank you for joining me, Darren. Please join us again Tuesdays and Thursday nights, 7 o'clock here on Amateur Sports TV for On the Ice. Uh, we welcome all feedback as well on the networks and all our social media platforms. Thanks for watching. Darren, congratulations on getting through part of this year, and hopefully we get to see hockey sooner than later. Thank you very much. Thanks, Theo. We'll see you soon. Take care, everybody. Have a great rest of the evening. Bye-bye for now.